Hi everyone, I'm gonna give everyone a minute to get in from the waiting room while I launch the closed captions. Okay, the closed caption should be up. You'll see a little red live box. It's at the top of your screen and you can click on that to access the closed captions in a separate window. I'm gonna put that in the chat box just in case you have trouble getting to it. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Christy Baglow, the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. And I'm really glad to have you all with us today for a webinar about immigrant detention in Florida. We have an amazing panel put together and it has been approved for CLE credit. Thank you to the public interest law section and Cabrail Banner. I have to give her a shout out for always getting our CLEs approved quickly. So thank you so much to Pills and Cabrail. We have with us today, Melissa Morantes and she is the executive director and co-founder of the Orlando Center for Justice. And we have Laura Pichardo Cruz with us, executive director of Hope Community Center in Apopka. And then we have Andrea Crumrine. She is an immigration staff attorney at the Legal Aid Service of Broward County. And finally, we have Jessica Schneider, director of the detention program at Americans for Immigrant Justice. This is being recorded and the PowerPoint will be sent out tomorrow along with the recording and the CLE information. The panelists have agreed to take questions throughout the webinar, time permitting, so you can type those into the Q&A box and we will take them at certain points during the presentation. Thank you again everyone for being here and welcome to our panelists. I will hand it over to you. All right, hi everybody. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Jessica Schneider. I direct the detention program at Americans for Immigrant Justice. And I'm really excited to chat with you all today about immigration detention. Um, we have a lot of great information to cover. And before I got started, let me see if I can figure this out in Zoom world, if folks could maybe raise their hands if you are an immigration practitioner and you've been practicing zero to five years. Let's see. All right. So we've got a few of you. Okay, if you could, I guess, uh, put your hand back down if that's how that works. Um, and some of you, any immigration practitioners that have been practicing, you know, five years and on if you could raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. All right. Okay, and if you could put your hands down. And then for those of you that, you know, really have no experience in immigration law and you're coming here to, to learn the basics, um, if you could please raise your hand. All right, and I'm going out on a limb and guessing maybe some people are not participating, but I think that's fine. I think we have a, for the other panelists, I think we have a, a mix, right? Um, so, you know, I'll go over the basics, right? Um, and then obviously if there are more complex or nuanced questions that you wanna ask, then of course we could take this in a little bit more of an advanced level if that's um, what's helpful for some of you. But since immigration is quite complicated as those of you practitioners know, we need to start from the very basics or we'll leave our, our colleagues that are just starting behind. All right, so let's start with the basics and that is what is immigration detention? So basically immigration detention pretty much looks like a prison or a jail basically. And although immigration laws are civil in nature, they're not criminal in nature, you have this kind of really weird criminal-esque sort of system where people are being held in detention centers and jails because um, immigration believes that they have either 
they violated immigration law or they have some kind of criminal conviction that makes them what we call them removable from the United States, right? And so the way that this looks is that, you know, um, people are in like all different kinds of, you know, sprawling jails or detention centers all around the country, right? Um, and so there's usually mainly three kinds of immigration detention. One of them is what we call a service processing center. And so um, that looks like a facility that's actually run by ICE itself. And that is what we call usually it's, you know, they're all called a detention center, but some of them actually function more as detention centers and some of them are actually also jails, right? And so service processing center um, is run by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, right, ICE, right? And it's ICE, those are the folks that are detaining people. So when somebody's in immigration detention, they're in the custody of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, right? Then you have private prison corporations. And so, you know, I think as attorneys, most of us are, are um, familiar with that. And what that looks like is that the government does not run the facility and set it contracts out to a private prison corporation, whether that's something like Geo Group or um, Core Civic. And so it is actually uh, the corporation that is running the day-to-day -day operations of the facility. Um, and then we have what we call intergovernmental service agreements or IGSAs. And what that looks like is that is um, basically ICE contracting out to local counties, right? And to local um, governments to basically uh, house ICE um, detainees in, um, in basically jails, right? So, and that happens all over the country. So what that looks like is though, even though somebody is in ICE custody, for civil reasons, um, not because of any kind of criminal, you know, um, charges, they still find themselves literally in the custody of a jail, so an actual jail. And oftentimes there's no difference really between those that are held in ICE custody and those that are held in county custody on criminal charges. So you have a system that is pretty unjust and inhumane, right? And it's, um, uh, unfortunately, the United States maintains the world's largest immigration detention system, right? I think you can go on to the next slide. Thanks. And so, you know, I just wanted to give a little brief introduction about um, immigration detention, the history of it, because, you know, the reality is, is that immigration with detentions, um, detention was created to be the exception rather than the rule, right? Unfortunately. And so that's not really what we're seeing today. So, you know, in the 80s, you know, during the Madiel Cuban boat lift, I mean, many of us in Miami, we know that and we live that reality, right? And so, um, you know, by and large, most people were not being detained. Some people were being detained or processed in for a short period of time. But for the vast majority of immigrants that, you know, came into contact with then INS, right, or, you know, some kind of immigration enforcement, they were processed through, but they were not really held in immigration detention centers, right? And then we had 9-11, right? And so I think we all recall what happened during 9-11 and there was a lot of anti-immigrant, you know, sentiment. And that's when we, you know, um, the Department of Homeland Security was created. And that's when you had a lot more money um, that was being funneled into the Department of Homeland Security for the purposes of detaining immigrants, right? And so, you know, what we, Unfortunately, what that gave birth to was this system, you know, this detention industrial complex that we have today, which essentially engages in, you know, the mass in incarceration of immigrants. Uh, next slide, please. And so I just wanted to give some numbers, you know, because now this is fiscal year 2019. Obviously, we're in a very different moment. Um, I didn't have these same numbers right now for, you know, 2020 or 2021, but I think it would be pretty misleading to give the numbers now. I think the numbers now are around 17,000, um, which is obviously pretty low, but that is not what immigration detention has looked like for like the past at least 10 years, if not more, right? And I think the reason why the numbers are lower today is one, because we're in a pandemic and a lot of people, you know, I guess some people were released. And also because the border under Title 42 is currently shut, right? So what does that mean is that not as many people are actually 
being let, although they're migrating to the United States, they're not able to really enter the United States to claim asylum, those kinds of things. And so we're not seeing as large of numbers. So um, that is, you know, I think one of the reasons, but I think you can take a look, obviously, you know, 2019, this is the height of the Trump administration. Um, but just to get an idea that, you know, I think that, you know, there are around 50,000 people in immigration detention at any given moment. And look at that detention budget. $3.2 billion. And out of those $3.2 billion, the percentage of people being held in a privately operated facility, 81%. So what does that really mean? What that means is that our taxpayer dollars, an inordinate amount of our taxpayer dollars, are going towards detaining immigrants, um, the vast majority of which are not a flight risk, are not a danger to our community, and it is really going to basically line the pockets of these, you know, large um, private prison companies that are certainly profiting off of the human suffering and the deprivation of liberty of immigrant communities. And I'll also just note when you see, and I know we're going to touch on this later, is that, you know, the number of deaths in immigration detention since 2003 is 214. That is a very, very high number. And so when us as immigration advocates say that immigration detention is literally deadly, that's not hyperbole, unfortunately. Okay, next slide, please. So, you know, focusing on Florida, since us are Florida practitioners, I just wanted to give a basic overview of kind of what immigration detention looks like in the state of Florida. Um, and so I think Florida is a really good example because of immigration detention nationally, because it has all the different kinds of immigration detention centers that exist, right? We have the Chrome Service Processing Center, um, which uh, detains around 600 individuals. That is their capacity anyways. That's in um, Southwest Miami, right, you know, um, literally bordering the Everglades. So used to be a lot more in the middle of nowhere as Miami has kind of grown more towards the West. It's, it's um, not quite as isolated, um, but that is actually run by, by ICE itself. It's a service processing center. And that's kind of what makes it a little bit unique. Excuse me, since the vast majority of um, detention centers are actually not run by ICE themselves, right? They usually contract that out. And then you have the Broward Transitional Center which is in Pompano Beach, Florida. Um, and for those of you that aren't as familiar with Pompano Beach, it's not that far from where Fort Lauderdale is. So still in the, in the South Florida area. And this is, you know, Broward Transitional Center is run by the GeoCorp, right? And so that is actually Geo Group, which is a private prison corporation that actually has their headquarters in Boca Raton, Florida. So it is a, a Florida um, company. Um, and so they run the Broward Transitional Center and the Broward Transitional Center, um, their maximum capacity is around 700 beds um, for to detain both men and women. I'll back up and say that at Chrome, um, they only detain men. Um, and so the thing that's a little bit unique about what we call BTC, right, which is another way that we call the Broward Transitional Center, BTC, is that um, it is a low priority facility. And so what that means is that it's basically for immigrants that have either little to no immigration history, um, excuse me, a criminal history. Um, and then we also have um, the Glades County Jail and the Glades County Jail that's in Moores Haven, Florida, which is um, about two hours away from Miami. It's um, in the middle of nowhere, right by Lake Okeechobee. Um, and so that's run by the Glades County Jail, actually. That's the run by the county. And so, you know, that is the same, you know, facility. If you're in Glades County and you commit a crime and you get arrested, you're going to the Glades County Jail. And that's the same place where ICE um, detains uh, immigrants, you know. Um, and Glades has a really, really horrible history of conditions and xenophobia and racism that uh, pervades there, unfortunately. Um, and then you have the Baker County Jail, which is in McClenny, um, Florida, which is uh, right outside of uh, Jacksonville in the Jacksonville area. And similar to Glades County, um, Baker is run by the county jail and it is a jail just like, you know, just like in Glades County, um, you know, immigration, those that are detained in immigration custody um, are also detained alongside those individuals that have been charged with um, a crime. 
Um, I just wanted to note that there are actually two facilities, um, two other county jails that used to hold um, uh, immigration um, folks. And so that was Monroe County Jail in Key West and um, Wakula County Jail, which is in Crawfordsville, which is kind of uh, close to uh, Tallahassee. And so um, it was actually the pandemic that uh, got Monroe County to cancel their contract. So in the beginning of the pandemic, um, they just really felt like there was way too much risk with uh, people coming back and forth into the county. And Monroe County Jail, I will say, it's a little bit unique in the sense that Key West, you know, and Monroe County is a county that actually has a lot of tourism, a lot of other money, you know, and um, a lot of these other local counties, you know, they see, immigration detention is kind of a cash cow for them, right? And it brings money into the county, which is similar for Wakula County. And the numbers in Wakula, the numbers overall nationally have dropped so much, but the numbers in Wakula dropped so much um, because of the pandemic, because of the Biden administration not detaining as many people. And so as a result of that, Wakula County actually said it's financially, it's not even feasible for us to continue to detain as the people. Um, and so they canceled the contract. So that's actually pretty good news. And that gives a little bit of a landscape. I mean, I did see a, a question um, flash up about um, the, uh, the um, children that are in detention. That is not my area of expertise. So I'll, I'll leave it to um, our other panelists that's gonna be focusing on that, but there are immigration um, detention centers um, that do hold um, children, um, although they're not, they're in the Office of um, Refugee Resettlement and Custody. So it's a little bit different. So um, we'll get to that a little bit later, but I wanna um, move us along to who is in immigration detention. So essentially, um, immigrants, it could be any kind of immigrant that is in immigration detention. Those that are undocumented, right? Meaning that they come to the United States and they don't have any kind of papers at all. They entered without inspection, as we would call it, meaning they didn't present themselves at a designated port of entry. It could be individuals that entered, let's say, for example, on a tourist visa and they overstayed. And so they no longer have authorization to remain in the United States. It could be immigrants that um, had documents, right, that including lawful permanent residents, right? And so, um, you know, those are people that have green cards, but, you know, may have um, either been arrested or have been convicted of you know, a certain um, crime. And so that then calls into question whether or not um, they have uh, the right to be able to remain in the United States, right? And so we see all kinds of people in immigration detention, asylum seekers, um, people that have lived in our community for long periods of time that have family members that are US citizens, um, individuals that have mental health issues, medical conditions, um, pregnant women, and then also families with children, because unfortunately in the United States, we still, um, you know, engage in the unfortunate practice of detaining families, although um, there are no family detention centers that are in the state of Florida. Um, and so we see a large swath of, you know, immigrants that are in detention. It's not any one kind of immigrant with any one kind of, you know, criminal history or immigration history. And so I'll just, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to back up and just talk a bit about some of the immigration basics, just so that if you're coming to this, you know, CLE trying to gain some basic knowledge because you, you want to take an immigration case or you want to understand a little bit about immigration, I think I would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the basics um, because immigration um, can tend to be a little complex. Uh, next slide. So you know, this is just like the little funny slide that I put up to say like, what part do you not understand, right? So immigration law, they say is the most complex area of law um, uh, ex after uh, tax law. For every rule, there's an exception. For every exception, there is a rule. And you know, the panelists, you were kind of joking even before this webinar that, you know, even, you know, after having practiced for, you know, well over a, a decade, I still you know, I'm learning every single day, um, you know, it is a very, very complex area of law. So um, that doesn't mean that it's not something that you can't learn or you can't tackle, but understand that as an area of law, it is not an area of law that is very intuitive, right? Where there are some areas of law where you can say like, 
oh, well, that just doesn't make sense or that doesn't feel right in my gut. Well, that doesn't really work with immigration law because it's a pretty piecemeal area of law that's highly kind of political, right? So um, it's just best to, to make sure that you're engaging in your due diligence. And also if you're confused, um, you're in good company. So don't feel bad. Okay, next slide. So I just wanted to give a basic overview and structure of um, the immigration agencies that we mostly deal with, right? So notice how we say formally the INS, you'll still hear some people refer to it as the INS, but they really shouldn't because ever since, you know, 9-11, um, when they created the Department of Homeland Security, they got rid of the INS, which was the Immigration and Nationality Service, right? And so what we have are under the DHS, we have, of course, there are a plethora of agencies that are under DHS, some of which don't even have anything to do with immigration. So here we're just going to be focusing on, you know, the three main agencies that work um, with immigration. So we have um, USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, and what CIS does is they are the ones that affirmatively grant benefits. So for example, if I'm going to apply for my green card or if I'm going to apply for a work permit, I'm going to apply to USCIS. And they're the ones that, you know, do the interviews. For example, if I'm going to apply for naturalization to become a US citizen, that is the agency that I'm applying to. That is not an enforcement agency, right? And so their job is basically to review immigration applications, interview people, make determinations, right? Um, then what we have is Immigration and Customs, Customs Enforcement, ICE, right? And so this is the agency that, you know, obviously is in charge of detaining and deporting people. So, you know, like I already mentioned, everybody that is in immigration detention is in the, in, in the custody of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And they're also the ones that are responsible for um, starting removal proceedings, right? Which means, you know, kind of deportation, right? Um, so those are the folks that are engaging in immigration enforcement in the interior of the United States, right? Then what you have is you have Customs and Border Protection, CBP. And so this is the agency that is essentially at all the ports of entry, right? And so what that looks like is, you know, when you come back from an international trip and then there's the, you know, government um, agent that's flipping through your passport and asking you questions, that is a CBP agent. And so they're the ones that make the determination as to who it is that's going to be inspected and admitted and allowed into the United States, right? And so those are for folks at all the ports of entry. And then you have the Border Patrol, which is part of CBP. And they're the ones that are actually in charge of kind of roaming around and enforcing, you know, our borders um, and in the areas in between ports of entry, right? So that's why we, we sometimes hear about the difference between border patrol and customs and border patrol. Um, that's, that's the difference between them. Okay, next slide. And so then I just wanted to touch briefly on immigration court because not everybody that's in immigration detention is going to have the opportunity to go into immigration court because some of them might already have, you know, orders of removal. Um, and so for those of you that aren't aware, an order of removal is kind of like deportation. Technically, there is a legal difference. Um, you know, the law changed. And so it should no longer be called deportation. It's removal proceedings. You have an order of removal, not a deportation order. We, a lot of us still tend to use that term interchangeably. And I think that, you know, kind of the lay term that most people use is deportation. So I just wanted to flag that, right? But anybody that, um, you know, um, is in the United States and, you know, has the opportunity to go before an immigration judge and they go to immigration court, you know, um, these are um, Article One courts, right? It's their administrative courts. And the immigration judge is actually an employee of the Department of Justice under the Executive Office of Immigration and Review, right? So you essentially have a Department of Justice employee, right, as an immigration judge that is making the determination in immigration court. And so the prosecutors that obviously represent the, in, those are the ones that represent the interests of ICE, right? And so it is actually ICE who is the agency. They're not only, you know, um, in charge of detaining and deporting people, but also placing people in removal proceedings and, um, you know, proving that they don't have um, the opportunity to remain in the United States under the law, right? 
Um, and then, of course, you have the non-citizen that, um, unfortunately, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but does not have the right to, uh, they have a right to an attorney, but since these are civil proceedings and not criminal proceedings, right, they don't have a constitutional right to actually have one appointed to them, unfortunately. So many people um, tend to uh, represent themselves pro se. So, um, you know, an immigration court, right? Um, so I guess obviously a clarification is that the immigration court is not part of DHS, right? And it's part of the Executive Office of Immigration Review, which I think obviously is a good thing. Um, I would argue though that when we see, for example, you know, um, that the courts, the courts not being an independent, you know, kind of um, arbiter that is outside of the executive branch, I think that we see under different administrations um, that the immigration courts are uh, look very different and are given very different guidance. And I think we saw that a lot under the Trump administration, right? So that is kind of a little bit of a caveat and a little bit of, I think, um, a negative factor of immigration courts being under the, um, the Department of Justice, right? And so one thing to note that's important is that any non-citizen is at risk of being placed into removal proceedings, even lawful permanent residents, right? And so um, I think we'll talk about this a little bit more, but there is this, you know, um, area of law, which we affectionately call crimigation, right? Which is um, where immigration law meets um, criminal law. And we see that there are many immigration consequences to certain kinds of criminal history, criminal activity, not even necessarily a criminal conviction. Um, and so this place puts people at risk of being placed into removal proceedings. Um, next slide. And so when somebody gets placed into removal proceedings, they're um, given a charging document, right? Which is called a notice to appear, right? And so when that charging document is filed with the immigration court, that's when it's initiated by the government, right? And so for those of you that practice you know, criminal law, it's similar to an indictment in criminal proceedings, right? And so the notice to appear doesn't necessarily mean that the person will be deported, right? It just means that they've been found to be removable or inadmissible from the United States. They might have some kind of immigration relief available to them. There might be arguments to say, you know, that the person should not, um, you know, that the proceeding should be terminated, right, um, against them. Uh, next slide. And so this is actually what a notice to appear usually tends to look like. And so if you're ever meeting with an immigration client for the first time, I think you definitely want to ask them if they've received this kind of document and you want to take a look at it because it gives you a lot of valuable information about what it is that, um, you know, your client is going to be facing, right? And so, you know, here we see, for example, that it's checked off, you are an arriving alien. You know, I'm not going to get into all the specifics or nitty gritty, you know, because an arriving alien is something that, you know, there's a definition under the code, right? But basically says all the reasons. So for example, if I had a client that, um, you know, entered the United States without permission, right, they crossed the border, and then they were apprehended afterwards, you know, then it would likely be marked off box number two, right, that you're an alien present in the United States that hasn't been admitted or paroled. Or maybe you were admitted to the United States, maybe you came in on a tourist visa, but then you overstayed. So you might be deportable, you know, for another reason, right? Okay, uh, next slide. And so then usually what we see are all the allegations or the reasons um, why it is that um, ICE thinks that your client is removable and then the corresponding law um, that justifies um, the removability and the reason why they're in removal proceedings. So that's just something just to have a general idea of kind of, the, those are very, very basics of like, what immigration and all the different agencies are and what kind of immigration court sort of looks like and what documents you might see. So I just wanted to really quickly just go over some of you know, the reasons why somebody might be at a risk of um, deportation. Um, and so, cause it might not be clear to everybody. So like we talked about for people that don't have any kind of immigration status or any papers, right? Even if the person has long-standing ties or if they're US citizens or lawful permanent residents, if they have criminal convictions, right? 
if they have an old deportation order, sometimes this happens, right? Is that if people have a, a, a court date, right? To present themselves in immigration court and they don't go, then they have like, um, they receive what's called an in absentia order. It means that automatically they re receive a deportation order in their absence, right? And so that's really problematic because a lot of people are kind of running around not realizing that they had to be in court at one point in time. And so they have deportation orders and they don't even realize it, right? So if somebody has an outstanding order of removal, then that puts them at serious risk of, of being deported, right? Um, and obviously to know that ICE will deport on citizens, even if they have minor children, you know, we've seen, unfortunately, it happens all the time that the primary caretaker, the parent, whoever it is, um, gets picked up, they get placed into ICE custody, and the child actually ends up um, in DCF custody. And so you have like this huge like family crisis, right? So, you know, um, there was a lot of talk about family separation at the border when they were physically separating the parents from their children. And obviously that is something that's horrific, but I think that got a lot of national attention. But the reality is, is that ICE has been separating families for years and years and years within the United States and within our own communities, um, just by virtue of just the massive kind of, you know, immigration enforcement and immigration um, detention and deportation machine that exists. Uh, uh, Jessica, if we could pause for a minute, we have sure. a question uh, about the notice to appear. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, if the notice does not state the law that has been violated, is it defective? Um, well, I would, you mean when we, when we go back and because yes, on every notice to appear, there should be maybe Andrea, if you can, uh, maybe we can backtrack a little bit so we can just take a, uh, yeah. Uh, Right. So if you see here, it says on the basis of the foregoing, it is charged as a subject is removable. Yes, there has to be a law there that indicates why the person is removable. Right. And so usually there is, and it would be an error, an error, I think, if there wasn't. And then for sure you would file um, what's called a motion to terminate. And you would basically just argue that the, that the notice to appear was not, you know, did not substantiate any grounds of, of removal, right? I mean, in reality, I think that the that ICE would probably just, you know, kind of refile an amended notice to appear. But yes, if there was no law or no kind of basis, you would make arguments. And I'll also just note that, you know, we're not getting into the nitty gritty of it, but there could be, you know, you don't have to admit all of the charges on a notice to appear, right? You can deny some of the allegations. You can make arguments saying that your client is not removable um, for many different reasons. Oftentimes, you know, there are many complex and nuanced arguments that you could be making, for example, saying that your client, you know, actually is not convicted of a certain kind of crime that would make them removable. And so there are a whole host of things that's beyond the purview. Um, of the training today, but there are definitely a whole host of things that you can do to challenge the notice to appear to begin with in the first place. But certainly, if the notice to appear, um, you know, on its face doesn't have all the things that it needs to have, like, you know, the corresponding statute um, claiming why the client would be um, removable or inadmissible, then certainly you can contest that with the court. Okay, I think we can move on forward. All right. Okay. Um, so, and then I just want to touch on the fact that, you know, non-citizens are vulnerable to being detained, you know, um, by immigration if, and this is important because people kind of ask, okay, well, you talked about who's in immigration detention, but like, how do people actually get there? And what does that look like? So I think what we tend to see a lot of times is that anytime that people that immigrants come in contact with the criminal justice system, their risk for then being um, funneled into immigration custody increases a lot, right? So sometimes if people are stopped by police, you know, uh, depending on what part of the state, you know, some parts of the state are more racist or xenophobic than others. I think we all just know that to be true. And so lots of times you'll have local law enforcement sometimes even be calling ICE, right, to come and get people, right? Um, also, if somebody, you know, if they finish a criminal sentence, right, 
um, there'll be what's called an ice hold place on them. We see all the time that people that are complying with their probation, right? And they go to their probation appointment and ICE is waiting for them there and they arrest them right there on the spot and they take them into ICE custody. Um, this also happens a lot of times when people leave the United States and they re-enter. This um, tends to be a lot of times like um, uh, lawful permanent residents, people that have a green card, right? They might have an old criminal conviction that makes them removable, you know, from like, I don't know, like the 80s or something. And so they might have traveled many times and come in and out, but it happens to be that, you know, somebody kind of figures it out when they enter and then, you know, they actually don't even let them enter the United States and they just take them and put them right away into ICE custody, right? And also, you know, people that, you know, um, go to apply for naturalization or they go to the immigration office um, or they're in immigration court, right? Even if it's just as a, as a witness, you know? Um, so anytime that you can come in contact with immigration, you know, immigration, unfortunately, you're kind of putting yourself in the lion's den. Um, I've even seen cases, for example, of individuals that like went to an airport to pick up a relative. So like, let's say you go to the airport to pick up grandma or whatever it is. And technically an airport is a port of entry. And so CBP has the authority and the discretion to be able to ask anybody that's there for their papers, even if they're just kind of like waiting in like the waiting area to pick somebody up. And so we've seen people be apprehended um, there as well. So that's something that is, um, obviously really troubling, but it's the reality that a lot of immigrants face. Uh, next slide, please. And so these are some of the, you know, kind of what we call danger areas. And so I think this is important for all of you that might not be practicing immigration law, but that might work with immigrant clients, um, is to just have an idea of kind of where these danger areas are, where people might be risking some kind of immigration enforcement, right? And so that looks like long distance buses or bus de depots in the northern part of the country could also look like Amtrak. So, um, you know, Greyhound, we've seen it happens a lot, right? Where, you know, like, let's be real, people that don't have the resources or don't have like a license because they can't get one and so are forced to, you know, travel on Greyhound buses. And so immigration knows this, right? Customs and Border Protection, they know this. And um, also just back up to say that because the lovely state of Florida is so long and skinny and a peninsula that the entire state of Florida is considered to be a border area because it's within 100 miles. All of the state of Florida is within 100 miles of a nautical border. So what does that mean? That means that not only do we have immigration and customs enforcement enforcing immigration laws within our state, but we also have customs and border protection acting like they're in a border area, even if they're like in Disney World, which is nowhere near any kind of a nautical um, border. So that's pretty problematic because it means that CBP will get on a Greyhound bus and we'll just ask everybody for their papers, right? So we've seen that a lot. And we've seen people go on vacation, they live in another state, they come down to Florida and they go on vacation and then they get apprehended, you know, on the Greyhound bus down here, whatever. Um, like I mentioned, airports, right? Um, of course, obviously, you know, jails, probation offices, like we just discussed, also ports, because don't forget that ports are ports of entry. Once again, I've, I've had clients and seen individuals, for example, that were like, Uber drivers that like want to go pick somebody up at a port and then they ask them for their for their documents right or you know we've seen people that are like you know close to marinas and might be engaging in fishing right in an area where maybe you're not supposed to fish or you're fishing while brown or whatever the case may be and so since it's close to a, a port area then they come and they apprehend individuals so um, you know and like we said any kind of um, public buildings um, courthouses all of these places could be potential, you know, danger areas um, where immigrants could, um, you know, unfortunately be subject to um, immigration, immigration enforcement. Okay. And so just wanted to talk, you know, recently, you know, I mean, obviously we're in a new administration and so it's kind of a new day. So things are obviously, you know, much better than they were under the Trump administration. But I will just say that in general, and even under Obama, what we've really seen is we've just seen the trends of more enforcement, more detention space, 
more police collaboration, more use of the criminal justice system, right? Um, just go up, up, up and up and, you know, um, legal protections available, discretion exercise in favor of immigrants really just go down, down, down. So we've really seen, you know, even though, you know, obviously practicing immigration law under Obama was totally different than practicing immigration law under Trump. And I'm certainly not going to say, you know, obviously Trump was like, you know, I would say for us immigration practitioners, that was pretty um, nightmarish years for us. I think I'm still suffering from PTSD from that. And it will take me many years to probably recover. Um, but nonetheless, you know, Trump did not start this, right? He certainly didn't start it. He added to it. But we certainly were on the upward trend of having um, a pretty robust immigration um, you know, uh, enforcement machine that engaged in, you know, um, lots of immigration detention and lots of collaboration with local law enforcement. Uh, next slide. So I just think it's important just to give a general idea to talk about one of the programs um, that we often see. And so what that is, is secure communities. And so um, what that looks like is that if I am arrested right and so like this happens all the time i'll give an example so let's say like i'm i'm a survivor of domestic violence and so um you know the the police is called and maybe i don't speak english really well or whatever it is and so they arrest both me and they arrest um, my abusive partner and so you know as part of that process you know they're going to take my fingerprints and so maybe at the end of the day after interviewing both of us or whatever it is um, local law enforcement decides actually to, you know, not kind of press any charges. They determine that I'm the one that has been victimized. Uh, it doesn't matter in that sense because my fingerprints have already been captured. And so part of secure communities is sharing. It's, it's basically a law enforcement information sharing program. And so they're going to take my fingerprints and they're going to check them against FBI or DHS databases. And so if I'm here unlawfully, and my fingerprints don't match or they're not in the system because if you have entered the United States lawfully, you have been fingerprinted because immigration loves to fingerprint people over and over and over again. Um, and so what that looks like is then um, a hold will be placed on me, what's called an ice hold. And what that does is that it's a usually what's called also a detainer. And so that gives that says to local law enforcement. So like, let's say in this example where um, I normally would be set free because they decided not to press any charges against me. But if I have an ice hold or an ice detainer, what happens is that that's like icing to local law enforcement. Hey, local law enforcement, we know that you legally don't have any other reason to hold this person. But as a favor to us, can you hold this person? for up to 48 hours, because legally that's how long they're allowed to hold the person. Can you just hold this person for us for 48 hours so that we can get our act together and come to your local jail and pick this person up for the purposes of immigration enforcement? And so this is what happens all the time. And so also where this usually happens is people driving without a license, right? And we see this all the time is that people, unfortunately, you know, within the state of Florida, if you don't have any kind of, um, you know, immigration papers, you're not gonna have the opportunity to be able to get a driver's license, even if you would like to have a driver's license. And so we see a lot of racial profiling, a lot of, you know, kind of pulling people over while brown or, you know, people that kind of look more like migrant workers or whatever the case may be. Um, a tail light out, whatever, whatever it is. And so the person gets pulled over and if they don't have a license, then nine times out of 10, they're arrested. And then even though they've only been arrested for something like driving without a license and normally they would just be, you know, kind of released on their own recognizance or whatever it is, this ice hold is put on them, an ice detainer, and then they get funneled into immigration, you know, detention and the immigration enforcement system. And so when we see these really high numbers, right, that say that, you know, a lot of people um, have criminal history or they've, you know, are in immigration detention because of criminal history or whatever it is, the vast majority of those cases are for really low lying under, you know, kind of offenses, things like driving without a license, driving with an expired license, those kind of things. So there is um, a very, I would say, unhealthy relationship, but one that exists between um, immigration, immigration enforcement and the criminal justice system. And so it's kind of one sort of continues to fuel and perpetuate the other. And 
obviously there's a, a, a whole host of problems that come along where you have a criminal justice system that already, you know, targets and marginal, I marginalized black and brown communities. And so we see um, a very disproportionate number of black and brown immigrants in immigration detention because of being caught up in the criminal justice system and then being placed into immigration enforcement, right? So um, that was just like, you know, basic background and general overview of, um, you know, kind of who's in immigration detention, what immigration detention looks like, how people get into immigration detention. I mean, I could go on for hours and hours about this. This is like a really robust topic that has a lot of complexity and nuances, but my other co-panelists, I'm sure, would like to get a word in edgewise. Um, no, just, I'll just say pretty briefly, um, you know, we're going to be pivoting, we're going to be pivoting towards um, talking about um, due process issues in immigration detention. And I'll just talk very briefly about um, COVID-19 because um, our organization was part um, of a lawsuit, which was called a uh, Gale versus Need. And so we filed um, a lawsuit in, um, in a federal district court in the Southern District in Miami um, uh, because to kind of enforce, um, you know, CDC guidelines and to try and get people released from immigration detention. Um, and just as like a little teaser before I pass it on to Andrea to just say that obviously um, immigration detention has really, really horrible conditions. And so I think that we saw that, you know, unfortunately under a Trump administration specifically a really inadequate response to a pandemic, um, not releasing people from immigration detention, um, a complete and total disregard for people's health, well-being. Um, and so we saw a lot of mass um, case spread um, ongoing and a whole lot of issues there. And so I just wanted to bring that up um, in your mind as an issue for imagining what it would be like to be in immigration detention during this moment, during a pandemic. Um, and I think that um, Andrea taking you now through all these due process issues, um, you know, will kind of highlight highlight, I think, um, some of those things for you. And of course, if anybody has any more questions about, you know, what we saw in immigration detention during the pandemic, then um, if we have more time towards end, I would be happy to answer those questions. So Jessica, mm -hmm. before you turn it over, just a quick, an earlier question about detention, if you could very briefly touch on mental health. So does ICE provide mental health treatment to detainees? And does ICE follow uh, Baker Act? proceeding, uh, uh, the process, Baker Act process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll actually, I'll hold some of that only because Andrea is going to be talking a lot about, um, you know, medical and mental health care. And so um, Baker Act proceedings, we usually don't see individuals that are Baker Acted. I mean, we could see individuals that have been Baker Acted and then go back into criminal custody and then are transferred into ICE custody. So certainly we have seen people that have been Baker acted in the past, but people that are currently in the process of being Baker acted, we usually do not encounter them in ICE custody. But we certainly see there are many complexities and issues with individuals that um, do have mental, mental health conditions. Um, and I'll let Andrea uh, get into that a bit more. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you for the comprehensive landscape and global overview of everything in immigration detention. Um, so I'm just going to briefly discuss some of the due process uh, issues and other procedural problems that people really face uh, while they're detained in ICE custody and how that can affect um, their fair day in court. So let's see, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So in my line of work, I primarily represent detained people in ICE custody who are in ICE custody because of some uh, criminal case or arrest or interaction with law enforcement, law enforcement authorities. So nine times out of 10, my client has some sort of open criminal case or recent criminal conviction. And I oftentimes see that these two cases really work in tandem and work together. Um, but on the immigration end, there are a lot of barriers that prevent people from really having a fair day in court or really having what's supposed to be a fundamentally fair uh, removal proceeding. So there are some basic laws that people are basic rights that people have in immigration proceedings that are in the local regulations or the relevant rele uh, regulations and the relevant immigration statutes. 
such as presenting witnesses and evidence and all of these um, basic rights are really inhibited by people's detained status. So I'll first just talk about the basic right to um, evidence and document gathering. Uh, people who are in ICE custody, who are in removal proceedings are essentially expected to participate in this court, this adversarial court process while they're in detention with very limited access to, to any sort of resources or materials. So we see a lot of problems generally with people being able to make photocopies of documents, um, get access to what laws um, even apply to them or what applications they might need to submit. Um, the law libraries in each detention center, um, oftentimes people or clients have difficulties accessing them. Uh, there's a specific schedule for when they can get to them and it just creates a very unfair procedure simply because they're detained. Um, also people, um, while they're in custody, have difficulties accessing documents like their medical records or their personal property. So if someone came from a local county jail and let's say their green card is in their property or their medical records are still in their property, it could take them a month to even get access to these documents they really need uh, to be able to present to the immigration judge or even to their ICE case officer to assess whether they should be detained. Um, so it's important to note that people oftentimes have two different immigration court aspects of their cases. One is their general removal case, which is whatever benefit or uh, defense they might present to the immigration judge to be able to stay in the country. And the other would be kind of their custody case. So if they qualify for a bond hearing with the immigration judge, or if they can be reviewed for release with their ICE case officer. And oftentimes people need access to their property, their documents, or perhaps they don't want to give over their original documents, they wanna preserve a copy. All of this has made so much more difficult um, by their detained status. Uh, we saw particularly during the pandemic, um, but legally that people were unable to really get their medical records. Um, sometimes it would take two months um, to be able to get a copy of their medical record to show they have a health issue um, that places them at greater risk if they were to contract COVID. Um, and it also plays a role in their immigration court hearing. I mean, if they have a significant health issue such as asthma or cardiovascular issue, um, that might help them in getting in a bond from the immigration judge. But because of lack of access or availability to a law library, uh, property, uh, a copying machine, uh, the entire process is just much more difficult. Um, other important evidentiary concerns in any trial or especially in immigration court um, are witnesses. Now, Jessica talked a lot about these remote facilities and how difficult it is to access people. Um, for a lot of our clients at Legal Aid who are indigent, their family members or close caretakers may not have access to a vehicle. And paying for an Uber or a Lyft to go testify at a hearing to Chrome, which is overdone by the Miccosukee Casino, is very difficult, especially if you live in Lauderdale or any of the Northern Broward areas. Um, we've also seen that some of the immigration judges down here in South Florida are not really interested in witnesses appearing by telephone. So the entire detention context or complex really makes it difficult, not only for detained people to meaningfully participate in the proceedings, but also for their family members to also engage and be um, available to assist their loved ones in their immigration court cases. Uh, the other thing I should note is that oftentimes individuals are appearing for these proceedings by video. During the pandemic, everyone in all the facilities have been uh, appearing either by video or by telephone, um, which is just fundamentally really not in the favor of the, the client or the person who's detained in custody. Um, not only does it dehumanize them and the, it allows the immigration judge to think more of them as a case number than a person, um, but they just don't have that human contact or that ability to really assess if someone is credible, if they're telling the truth, um, things that just might pull some more sympathy or empathy from the, from the immigration judge. So a couple other things just to think about when we're talking about detained cases. So as Jessica mentioned, these facilities are far away and it's, they're remote and oftentimes um, individuals who might be able to pay for a private attorney are priced out because of the logistical costs 
of traveling to the Glades County Detention Center, traveling to these other remote facilities. And so oftentimes people who are in detention don't have access to an attorney. And I know during the pandemic, a lot of local nonprofits have had to uh, cut or drastically reduce their presence in the local facilities. So we see a lot of people who either don't know really what their rights are, what their options might be, or fundamentally what removal proceedings are. I think this presentation has already really shown that these proceedings are very complicated. And for people who don't have access to an attorney or information, um, it can be very overwhelming, if not fundamentally unfair. Um, other things to note, the while people are detained, and this is something I commonly hear from my own clients, uh, that just the distribution of information to people who are in custody um, is very, very slow and oftentimes frustrated. I know that the rollout of information about COVID-19 and social distancing guidelines was all very, very slow in all the facilities. And even information about immigration court being transferred to different facilities, all of this happens at such a slow, slow pace. And even make something as basic as phone calls. Oftentimes phone calls are very costly. I know during the pandemic, ICE has given people a certain slot of 20 minute free phone calls. But once those phone calls are up, if you are indigent or can't afford to pay for more phone calls, it can be very difficult to access your family members or access other information. Um, I'd also like to note that, especially for Glades County Detention Center, ICE officers oftentimes go there uh, once a month, very infrequently, particularly during the pandemic. And so people, clients, anyone who's in custody, just their access to information, knowing what's going on with their cases um, is all very, very delayed. They can submit uh, what's called a detainee request form to gather more information about their cases. But oftentimes the response is um, handwritten or not very helpful or comprehensive and surely not the same as speaking to someone in person. Now there are just a whole host of other issues that come along with trying to fight your detained case um, from a remote facility. Um, and this could be a whole other presentation, but um, I do wanna note that there are, we have seen a lot of issues with people who speak rare languages, particularly indigenous Mayan languages and participate meaningfully in the removal proceedings. So if you speak a particular um, indigenous language, they may not, the ICE may not have an interpreter available, the immigration court may not either. Um, and surely the signage or forms that one has to fill out in immigration court are not translated in all languages. Um, when people are in immigration court proceedings and they wanna file an application for relief, such as asylum or cancellation of removal, let's say, um, the courts require that people submit forms in triplicate copy in English. So if you are illiterate and you don't speak English, the odds are already very much stacked against you. So all of this really is to kind of um, highlight or underline that these proceedings are extremely difficult, especially for detained people, not to mention detained unrepresented people. Andrea, yeah. if I could uh, pause there for a second, because we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one question is, uh, uh, where would a practitioner find uh, regulation or policy as to what qualifies for bond? Sure. So different. there are a few particular, I mean, first, the American Immigration Lawyers Association offers resources. The ILRC also offers a whole host of resources. Um, that are even available online. Uh, the American Immigration Council, they also provide great resources. Uh, the University of Miami Immigration Clinic, I also know provides great free resources online. Um, if you're looking for more in-depth um, technical resources, I would recommend Mary Kramer's Immigration Law Resource Book. Um, and of course, Ira Kurzban's um, Immigration Law Desk Book. Those are all good resources um, to learn about bond eligibility. The second question is a more practical question, and that is um, how would a practitioner, how would an advocate get um, the name and contact for a particular ICE case officer? 
Sure. So if, if you're an ALA member, I know that the local chapters do send out a roster of all of the case officers. Um, that's how I get my updated roster, which seems to be oftentimes changing. Um, otherwise, sometimes when clients are processed or they do speak to a case officer within a week or so of entering the facility, uh, sometimes they'll tell the client, like, so-and-so is your deportation officer. Um, but I try to always remind my clients, like, when you speak with a deportation officer or a case officer, make sure you get their name and any of the contact information. I'm not sure, Jessica, if you have any other suggestions. Yeah, I would just say that um, sometimes if you <clears throat> excuse me, call the front desk of whatever facility it is, you can sometimes maybe ask if they have the information for the deportation officer um, or at least um, uh, one of the supervisors, because the way that it works is that everybody's assigned a deportation officer. And then you have um, what they call the SDDOs, which are the supervisory detention and deportation officers that kind of oversee the deportation officers. And so usually if you can get the name of um, one of the supervisors, you can ask them. And with the last two digits of your client's um, alien number, they can usually, that's how the clients are assigned a deportation officer. And sometimes they'll be able to help you in that regard. That would be my only other recommendation. I mean, yes, ALA does have really good um, resources and we liaise regularly with ICE and they provide us with their updated docket sheet. I mean, to that extent, if you all, you know, need information and you're not an ALA member, you can also feel free to reach out to me. I have access to that information as well, if that would be helpful. Thank you. Those are good questions. Is there anything else? Okay. Was it? I touch on some of the other flagrant, flagrant issues that we see in immigration detention. Um, I think something that frequently comes up and I think was very much highlighted um, during the pandemic is just the really inadequate medical care that we see across all these facilities. Um, each facility has a medical health unit. The Chrome Service Processing Center has a particular health unit for people with uh, psychiatric um, mental health issues as well. But I mean, oftentimes it's very difficult to, to see a medical professional regularly uh, to have continuity in the psychiatric or um, mental health medication people have been taking. Um, sometimes they'll switch them to uh, what might be a generic, but isn't necessarily exactly what they were taking before. Um, there are a whole host of access to proper medical care issues um, within all of the detention facilities. Um, during COVID, we were able to get many clients released because of their health issues. Um, but we also saw that people who had COVID or people who had particular health issues were being almost disciplined and placed in medical isolation, um, which was essentially like a, uh, what you think of as like a shoe or like a high security medical or a high security room, um, which in a lot of cases just exacerbated people's mental health issues or other related illnesses. The other thing that to me, is important to remember in this entire context is that detention is extremely isolating. People are taken away from their families, they're with strangers, they're in an unfamiliar uh, context. Um, visitation can be impossible, um, if not, I mean, cost prohibitive. They do have some video visitation, but it's limited and very expensive. Um, and so I think that's also important to, important to note. I know that someone mentioned Baker Act earlier. I think that we touched on that. Um, but I would note that people who have been, have been received treatment under the Baker Act in the past, uh, if they're able to gather medical records, if they're going into immigration custody, I always tell people that that's something that's helpful to have on hand. Um, most of my clients are already are in criminal custody. And so I can prepare for their transfer into immigration custody. So when I'm doing that process, I might try to gather their medical records. If they have an immediate relative they care for who has health issues, I might try to get their mm -hmm. medical records to have those on hand for a release request or a bond hearing. Something else that does come up oftentimes in South Florida are cases of prolonged indefinite detention. So this comes up a lot for people after they've already been ordered deported whether it be while they're currently in proceedings or whether they were previously or deported years ago and are now 
uh, back in immigration detention. So this applies to people who are considered post removal order, which means the Board of Immigration Appeals could dismiss their appeal and they didn't uh, follow up with a stay or some sort of PFR, or it could be after an immigration judge orders removal um, and they don't appeal within the 30 day uh, mandatory period, or they just decide not to appeal altogether and they waive their appeal. So after someone's been ordered deported, generally ICE, well, this isn't generally, ICE is required as a matter of law to review their custody 90 days after their removal order is considered administratively final. So at the 90 day review, the case officer assigned to your client's case is supposed to consider whether they're a flight risk, whether they're a danger to the community, and whether there is a, a foreseeability of removal um, in their case. So if they think that it's not likely we'll be able to deport this person because um, they're from Somalia and Somalia isn't currently accepting their, their, their nationals for deportation, we're just going to release them. In other cases, ICE might say, no, we're gonna kick it to the 180 day custody review. So federal law requires that ICE review or re-review someone's custody at the 180 day mark, but that happens in Washington DC at ICE headquarters. Um, so they take them, um, uh, that's, that's where they would do a 180 day review of the case. Uh, and the same thing happens. They assess dangerousness, um, whether they're at risk of flight or if they would abscond if they were released um, and whether there's the likelihood of removal. So um, during this process, if you're representing someone who's detained, you can submit like a package of documents to show that they're not a flight risk or danger to the community. That might look like letters of support or recommendation from family members and friends, proof that the person has been living in the United States for a while, proof of any rehabilitation if possible, such as participation in any classes, certificates, uh, things of that nature. Um, and then after 180 days, um, detention is basically considered presumptively unreasonable if there isn't a likelihood of removability. So, which brings me to the next slide about um, Zadvidas. So this is a US Supreme Court case that really lays out the groundwork for um, challenging prolonged or indefinite detention. And this is generally for people who are post 180 days. When I say generally, I mean generally. Um, and they there doesn't appear to be um, a significant likelihood of removal in the reasonably foreseeable future. And so in some of these cases, the best remedy or recourse is to file a habeas petition in the district court's location, um, that's where your client is detained physically. So if clients are detained in South Florida, uh, the local district court will be in the Southern District. If they're detained at Glades, it'd be the Middle District of Florida. So um, I'm going to give a shout out now for any pro bono interest, because we do see a lot of cases where um, we need assistance with cases where people are being indefinitely detained and they're right for a habeas petition but because of the um, because of resources and um, the federal district court admissions uh, we don't necessarily have all the resources that legally to do this so um, that's kind of my plug for pro bono help and my last slide about indefinite detention and I think that is it for me I might just pass it along to the topic of children in detention thank you so much Andrea um, so now on children in detention, um, and feel free, any questions that come up, to throw them in the chat. You'll go to the next slide. So earlier there was a question of, do we have children detention facilities in Florida? Yes, the answer is yes, we do. Um, by my account, um, there's currently more than nine throughout the state. Um, the locations are confidential, so probably why some people may not hear about them all the time. Uh, they come in different forms. So they're meant to be least restrictive uh, means possible. So um, some of them look like temporary foster care. They're, uh, you know, if you're interested, <laughs> there is an opportunity even to help in the, uh, being a foster parent. Um, so you can be a foster parent to immigrant children and they stay with you temporarily while reunification with their family or um, someone who their family has elected as possible. There's also shelters where they live at, like a, a bed shelter, um, but it looks a lot more like a um, children's home um, in, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, there are some that still, uh, conditions are not the greatest. Um, my experience though, uh, at least in the ones that, that we visit, um, has been positive. Uh, so I know there's, you know, it's, it's not, 
it's not perfect, but there's been positive and negatives there. The others look at residential treatment facilities, and that may be because a person has a particular condition or there's a particular concern and wanting to um, uh, get them into a program where they receive treatment. Um, that's more along the lines of like if a, a child has a diagnosis or there may be a concern for self-harm um, or uh, something else going on, they wanna make sure the child's safe. Next slide. Um, so rights and protections of kids in detention. Really quickly, so children that are detained do have a right to education, to shelter, to recreation, food, healthcare. Um, definitely respect is something that we wanna make sure they're safe um, and calls to their family. Um, they're also um, provided with Know Your Rights presentations and uh, legal intake, and this is due to a lot of advocacy um, on the part of um, organizations and groups to be able to have this uh, litigation, of course. And so um, those are given to children that are detained. There's also a legal right to present a defense to deportation. So if a child has a hearing while they're in detention, um, the UAC, which is the acronym for unaccompanied children, um, would get representation at a hearing uh, while they are detained. Next slide, please. So how does this all happen? How do children get detained? How does it work? So the first question we'll ask is what is the Flores settlement? Um, so why it's important. So this is the, what governs detention and treatment of immigrant children that are in government custody. And what does it require? So it requires that the government release children without unnecessary delay. Um, you know, we, there's always that reasonable, right? And what that standard is, what is unnecessary delay um, in order of preference. So they start with the child's parents, if they can release them to their parents, um, it's much easier, easier to prove, easier to release the child. Then they can really, uh, or a legal guardian, I apologize. Um, and then they could release them to another adult relative. So it could be an adult sibling, a, a grandparent. The further out we get in the family structure, the more difficult it is to prove uh, lineage and be able to have that release. Um, the government would also put children in their least restrictive setting appropriate, which is why you have those different types of shelters. And then the government would create and implement standards for the care and treatment of the children while they're in detention. So that's what the Flores settlement requires. Now let's look at it a little more in, in how it works out. Um, we also have the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, and these two sort of play together. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about this and know that I'm talking about it only in the perspective of detained children um, because the TVPRA does a whole host of things in immigration um, and more, um, but I do wanna just talk about it just in the context of immigrant children. So, I um, mean, detained children. So in 2008, the TVPRA codified parts of the Flores Settlement into federal law, preserving certain rights for immigrant children. And in 2015, there was a district court judge um, in California, uh, Judge Dolly B, who ordered that the administration must release detained children and their mothers, saying that the detention centers in Texas had failed to meet the Flores standards, right? So earlier on, I know some of our other speakers talked about just the deplorability of some of the detention centers, what they look like, um, how, how they appear. And there was a huge concern for some detention centers in, in Texas. Um, some of you may know, may have heard about Dilly. Um, Dilly, Texas in particular was one that, that came up repeatedly. Um, so Judge Key's decision, what it did to the Flores settlements in the context of children, if I just stay within that context, um, it expanded Flores to not only cover just unaccompanied children, but also accompanied children. So if a parent comes with a child, um, the rules also apply um, to that child, not just children that come on their own, okay? Um, under the TVPRA, unaccompanied children, and for those of you who may not know, unaccompanied children are those that come across, come into the country or um, on their own, so they're not with a guardian um, who's with them. And um, I'm gonna say that a little lax because someone could come with a guardian, but if they can't prove that, that's their, that they have that relationship, they may be separated. Um, always, uh, you know, it seems like the interest is looking out for a child um, to make sure they're not being trafficked um, and for their safety. And so a lot of that separation happens um, from that point, which can be very um, disheartening and, and scary, especially when a child's traveling with an aunt um, or um, a family member who they're very close to. Um, sometimes it's a father, but may not be on the birth certificate. These are some of the family separation issues that we ran into and, and we may see when it comes to children. Um, under the TVPRA, an unaccompanied child must be transferred to the care of ORR um, custody. And so that's why the Office of Refugee Resettlement, that's ORR, is the one that's responsible for them and places them at these shelters all across the United States. Um, there's, there's not currently um, a uh, 
sort of order of where they go is sort of based on availability. And, and I'm sure there's some other internal factors that we're not sure how, how they're placed, um, but children seem to go all over. So a child may end up in Florida, but then be released into Oregon, or a child may end up at Texas, go to New York and then go back to Texas, right? Um, uh, so a lot of those factors play into who they're gonna be released to and how that rolls out. Under the two PRA, an undocumented child is, el um, is eligible for something called special immigrant juvenile status if reunification with one or both parents is not possible due to abuse, neglect, or abandonment. So for some of you practitioners who practice uh, dependency, who practice in probate court, who practice in other courts, um, you know, you may be able to help out immigration practitioners who are not licensed in the state of Florida. That may be another pro bono plug um, or volunteer opportunity for children because um, there's a great need and uh, in effect um, for even those immigration practitioners who stop doing uh, state cases, that are related to SIJ, we'll talk about just briefly. Um, they are alive and well. Um, we are doing them in, in plenty of counties um, and being successful. Um, so, so it is alive and well. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So special immigrant juvenile status. So why is this important to kids that are detained? Well, while they're detained, um, the, there are attorneys um, and some, something of what my office at Orlando Center for Justice does, um, American Immigrants for Justice does as well, and there, may be, and there are others. Um, but the organizations are, um, are watching uh, to see if children have eligibility for SIJ, if children are nearing 18, if children um, have been abused, abandoned, or neglected. Um, and part of that is because there's this uh, sort of high uh, crossroads between state law and immigration law that connect here. So in, a, uh, in order to get special immigrant juvenile status under immigration law, it says that you have to have a predicate order from a juvenile court, okay? So a child must be declared dependent on juvenile court of the state in order to qualify for this status. In Florida, that requires a child be under 18, unmarried, but you can imagine how different this is across the board when in some states, they must be 21 years of age. In some states, they cannot get um, a, a, an order um, if they're in detention. So getting them out of detention is the key before being able to get them into state court in the predicate order. So there's so many factors working together to try to be able to protect children for right that they do have. Um, and so it's very uh, state specific and it can even be, you know, as you guys all know, as, uh, as practitioners, it can be very jurisdictional specific. Okay. Um, so if they're detained, um, so like the children that we deal with that are in detention centers, if they're detained, in addition to just being able to take them into state court um, and get a predicate order, we have to request specific consent. And so, um, Specific consent means that we're asking for ORR, the Office of Refuge Refugee Resettlement, to consent to us moving the placement of this child out of detention into some other care, whether it's the Department of Children and Families and the state system in Florida, uh, for example, um, move them into a caretaker that we found that can take them, um, or, but changing that placement, um, sometimes it's moving them out of a restrictive facility because children can end up in, in highly restricted facilities, maybe because they're receiving some sort of treatment, but we now believe they need to be stepped down out of that restrictive facility. Because uh, as I mentioned, under the Florida settlement, they need to be in the least restrictive setting for children. And so sometimes that means getting them out of some of these treatment programs once they're ready, but the, the delay can take time, the red tape can take time. And so trying to use what we have, um, our legal tools to get them out of these facilities. And this can be one of them. Um, there's an overlap with juvenile court here, as I explained, because it requires that this, there's a predicate state order with specific findings. So the goal was to explain just how we use these tools to deal with detained children and detain children's cases, not so much to go into specifics of it, but those of you that have experience in dependency court, family, like I said, probate, um, there can even be via guardianships. There's a lot of great opportunity here for being able to work with children that are either detained and even after they've been released. All right, let's go to the next one. A Flores bond hearing. So this is another tool, tools that we can use to help detain children um, and tools that can be used for detention. And it's important whether you do work with detained children or not to know these, this information, because even as an immigration practitioner, you can be re representing the parent of a child who's detained. 
And then you're starting to hear about those issues and those concerns. So um, thank you all for um, being a part of this, whether you work in another area or in immigration, because I think it can be very important. So what is a Flores bond hearing? Um, so on July 5th, 2017, in a case called Flores v. Sessions, um, there was it was confirmed that all detained immigrant youth have a right to a bond hearing before an immigration judge, okay? So what it, why is it important? Because it's a tool that we can use with children. So in a Flores bond hearing, an immigration judge gets to determine whether a child poses a danger to, commu to a community. And that may seem surprising to some people, you know, a child posing a danger to the community. Well, in some cases, there, there can be a concern, whether it's because of mental health history, whether it's because of, of confusion. Um, I will tell you that a lot of children, it's in my experience, and it's all my own personal story, I'm not saying anyone here, but um, children oftentimes, when there's a language barrier, they act out. And they're acting out because they're scared and don't know. Imagine, take yourself. Someone took you away from the people you were traveling with on a plane, okay? An example. Or took you away from people you were traveling with when you were out on an excursion, an example. And put you in another group with a totally different language that wasn't your own. And people are telling you do this or do that. And you're not really sure what they're saying. They're grab not necessarily grabbing at you, but maybe they're trying to guide you somewhere, you know, using um, body language to guide you somewhere. You're not sure. And so uh, children, you know, reflect and act out. And, um, and a lot of times, once they're able to get someone speaking their language, once they're able to get in, into an environment they can, a lot of those factors calm down and disappear and dissipate. I'm not saying it's all situations, but I've seen it very frequently. So I just share that, you know, this is not to scare that, like, what do you mean children posing a danger to the community? Sometimes initially it appears they're a danger to the community. And as those factors get put in place, translators, different things, and they feel like they're being heard, or they've kind of been able to process what's going on, things change. Okay, I know we have 10 minutes left, so I'll try to wrap up here. Um, so what is it that we do with a Flores bond hearing? So it's a request and there's Flores counsel to help if you're ever in one of these situations where you are representing a parent and you feel like a child might need a Flores bond hearing. Um, there's Flores counsel that can we reach out to. Um, but what it is, is a special hearing for a judge to determine if that child no longer is a threat. Um, or wasn't a threat in the first place if there was a misunderstanding um, using evidence um, that can be put on. Now, even though the, the judge may determine, yes, they're no longer a threat to society, they can be released, they're not automatically released or are still in charge of making sure that there's a sponsor or a place to send that child. And for children in secure detention, which is those that are being under treatment um, for any concerns, this kind of hearing can be an opportunity to contest their level of confinement, just how much they're being confined. Um, and their risk to others, or even sometimes, you know, whether they indeed did or did not um, commit a criminal offense. Um, so it's a very important tool. And um, if you'll go on to the next slide. Um, so this is for the end, I know, um, just for some of you with our CLE, but those are, I'm open for questions. I think all of our panelists, if they wanna join again, or we have about nine minutes left that we can be open for any questions that might come up um, regarding just these different areas as far as detention or detained children. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, while we're waiting for folks, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we do have a few minutes, you could put them in the chat. I just want to renew Andrea's call for assistance on pro bono. Uh, all three of these organizations are nonprofits operating in South and Central Florida, and they are, I'm sure, overwhelmed with more cases than they can handle. And for reference, that's Americans for Immigrant Justice in Miami-Dade, Legal Aid of Broward County, and Orlando Center for Justice here in Central Florida. Um, so if you are so inclined and you have the time, please reach out to them. They can really use your help. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I just want to say while we're waiting to see for questions, um, sometimes people are wondering like, oh, I don't know if I have time for pro bono. What are other ways that I can help? Um, there's all kinds of support mechanisms. So um, please feel free to, to reach out on our website or AIJ's website or even Broward County, I'm sure, um, or to any of the panelists um, emails where they can direct you in the right direction. But there are different things. For example, um, sometimes it can be supporting by, um, when you purchase on Amazon, supporting the nonprofit um, as one of your groups. Sometimes it can be through donations, um, being able to donate to efforts. If you have a particular heart for children in detention, I know a lot of us maintain like a list of things that are needed for children uh, who are detained. Um, and so there can be things that, um, that kind of make their detention easier, um, help you know, help ease the time. Um, it, the same may, may be existing for people who are um, adults who are detained. I don't know if you can donate minutes or time or contributions to, to help them be able to have 
those minutes to communicate. So I just want to kind of put it out there because I feel like sometimes we're like, oh, I don't know if I can handle extra pro bono, you know, we're getting out, we're in a pandemic, you know, there's a lot going on. But um, I think that a lot of times um, the monetary or, or in kind uh, donations can be super helpful. So just want to put that out. And um, can you confirm also that there's varying levels of commitment to these cases and also that there are virtual opportunities? I would imagine there's still a lot of virtual opportunities if folks were interested. Is that right? Yes, uh, at least on our team, that's my experience. I'll, I'll let Andrea and uh, Jessica um, explain on their end. But with us, yes, absolutely. Um, it can be everything from um, if for detention work, um, a lot of times, and we're, we're constantly brainstorming. So near us, and we're in Central Florida, um, we have Baker, um, which is a Jacksonville facility. We're constantly brainstorming, like, what are ways that maybe if we're not able to provide direct representation, could we provide assistance in a way that may be temporary, um, may be informative, um, from creating resource guides for families. Sometimes we have um, students, we work with law students and we create like resource guides for families. Like how do you find your 10 family member? Basics on knowing how to get their A number. It's usually on a wristband that they wear and it has it, has it on it. Um, just different things that seem uh, simple but they can help uh, even practitioners uh, be able to assist them. So there's all kinds of things that, that, um, that we could do at varying levels. I wanted to let everyone know I'll, I'll send out a resource list with all the agency's websites and ideas for how you can help with the recording and the PowerPoint tomorrow. But thank you to all of our panelists for all that information. I, I learned a lot, of course, and I appreciated all the, the tips for those of us who, who are not immersed in the immigration world every day. And thank you to all of you for surviving the past four years and for continuing to do this work in Florida. I know it is never easy, uh, no matter what the political situation is. So thank you. I don't see any other questions. Got some compliments about the great presentation. And I did want to announce the CLE number in case anyone is listening on their phone and can't see it on the screen. The CLE number is 4937. Again, it's 4937 and it's been approved for 1.5 credits. And you'll get the recording link and the PowerPoint link from Zoom tomorrow. And just let me know if you are not able to get that. Do any of our panelists have any final words? I have a, a brief plug, if I, if I may. Yes. Um, so uh, this presentation was co-sponsored uh, by um, the Public Interest Law Section of the Florida Bar. We do have what has uh, been long dormant, an immigrant uh, work group. Um, I am trying to revive that. Uh, this CLE was kind of a, a push in that direction. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Uh, please reach out to me. You do not have to be an immigrant practitioner or expert. Uh, we're looking for anyone, practitioners who um, work in public interest and who, whose work touches on uh, immigrant communities. It can be anything from criminal defense, um, eligibility uh, for, for public benefits from the immigrant community, anything like that. Uh, if you have ideas and you want to share them, we'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to go ahead and, and put my contact information there if anyone's interested. And I'll definitely send that out with a link to the PILS website and the materials tomorrow so you can join if you're not already a member. But thank you so much to all of our panelists and for Laura, who's a great moderator. She made my job very easy today. So thank you all for attending. I hope you have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.